following show is a paid program. How you doing today? We have the best of the best with us, Dr. Tommy Watson, author, executive coach, speaker, movie producer, from homelessness to doctor. Hello, my friend. How you doing? Cam, how you doing, my man? Man, I tell you, I started reading your story. I was crying last night. I said to myself, <laughs> I've got to talk to Dr. Tommy Watson. How? Let's Pleasure get to be started. On. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's go from when you just remember your start and on through the process. Let's tell your yes. story. Yes, Cam, again, thanks for having me on, brother. So, you know, I'm originally from Denver, Colorado. My mother and father growing up there were drug addicts and shoplifters. So they were heroin addicts. And my siblings and I uh, spent a lot of time, unfortunately, uh, in foster homes, crisis centers, motel rooms, bouncing around from place to place to place. Um, you know, I tried to join a gang when I was in third grade because I had so much emptiness going on inside of me. I remember, um, you know, by the time I was in second grade, actually um, being in a number of foster homes, number of schools, living with my grandmother several times, different motel rooms, got kicked out of our house. My teachers didn't believe me, I didn't believe in myself. I remember being in this one very, very difficult situation. My parents would leave us by ourselves. There were six of us and we were never all together as kids growing up but they would leave us by ourselves for days by ourselves. It was my older sister was in sixth grade. The other one was in fifth grade. I was in second grade. My little brother was in first grade. We had a one-year-old baby sister. And uh, during this time, we would go to school, not necessarily to learn, but to steal food. And we would go uh, steal food. My older sister was in sixth grade. We'd stay at home with my baby sister. And the other three of us, we would go to school, take food and take it back so my sisters could eat. On the weekends, we would go in grocery stores, steal food, run out of the, ex the exit doors just so we can eat. And I remember shortly after that, Cam, we found ourselves in this foster home and I was so angry because we had been separated from my little baby sister and I didn't want to be there. I was defiant. I didn't listen to anything that they told me. And it was one particular day when a lady and her son showed up. Uh, we were told to go out in the hallway and talk to this young man and we went out to the hallway. And uh, long story short, this young man who was with this, this person ended up being my brother. And it was mind blowing because I'm saying, wow, this is the first time I've ever met my, my oldest brother in a foster home. Shortly after that, in third grade, I was with my aunt, and my goal as a third grader was to join the local Crips with hopes of leading the local Crips as a third grader because I had so much hurt and pain inside of me. Um, stayed with my aunt for uh, about two years. About my seventh grade year, was back with my mother and father and found ourselves getting kicked out of our house in front of all of my friends in seventh grade. And I remember being so embarrassed and not sure what was going to happen next. We ended up moving into our seventh motel room. It was nine of us. We stayed my entire eighth grade year of school. And you're talking about six adults are all drug addicts. And me and my little brother and little sister left the fence for ourselves. But the thing I kept doing during this time, Cam, was stayed involved in sports. And sports saved me. Ended up getting a scholarship to go to a private suburban Denver high school after my parents went back to prison again. By my senior year, my mother and father had been arrested 121 times and I was actually homeless. Um, bounced around from place to place to place as an All-American football player. So you're talking about a lot of chaos in my early years. Um, it was unbelievable. Wow, that is something. Let's see the video real quick of Dr. Tommy Watson. Tommy Watson wanted more than a life filled with drugs and crime, but he knew it would take something close to a miracle to achieve it. Carol Evans' Randy Shaver is here now with Tommy's incredible story. Randy? Amy, there's a poem that reads, Dreams are hard to follow, but don't let anyone tear them away. Hold on, 
There will be tomorrow. In time, you'll find a way. Well, tonight, an unbelievable story about a former Gopher football player that brings those words to life. We were not their number one priority at all. Minnesota graduate Tommy Watson's life reads like a Hollywood screenplay. As a child, he and his family lived in 25 different locations, including seven motel rooms. Stay down or you're going to die. By the time you're in third grade, Tommy, it's hard and painful to say, but you would have been through a lot. A lot of the foster homes, motel rooms, and crisis centers, and parent incarcerations will certainly take a toll on your emotions. Life will even seem unfair at times. Today's the day you gotta go see mom. Seeing mom in shackles will be very difficult and heartbreaking, but you have to be strong. I know you're feeling lots of pressure, but like I said, suck it up, keep going. I need you to look mom in the eye and tell her everything is okay. Despite the emptiness and abandonment you may be feeling inside, I know, Tommy. It's tough and it doesn't seem fair, but it's your life now. It's what it is. Tommy, through it all, you will discover that there's always been a plan for your life. Tommy, your story will be used to inspire millions. You'll beat the odds. How do I know all this? Because I am you, Dr. Tommy Watson. You'll beat the parental incarcerations, the foster homes, the crisis centers, the motel rooms. You will persevere. You will show great resilience. I'm very proud of you. Hey, buddy. Hey. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a lot. Yeah, that's yeah. powerful. You know, as, as you were as you were showing that, I was thinking about my mother. Can you imagine the person, Cam, who brings you into this world, who's supposed to be your protector, your guidance? You got to go see this person in a in a prison. Yes. And in, in your elementary years, and you seeing this person who's who's shackled up. You know, can't connect with you freely. A time limit. You're seeing people around her with guns and what have you. Right. It's very. Uh, it, it was very disturbing as a third grader to have to go see my mother in those conditions. And then to see her have to leave the room, Kim, locked up again and not knowing when I would ever see her again. You know, wow. you're talking about a painful uh, childhood and, and not sure what tomorrow was going to bring. That was the thing that was, you know, a, a common theme, if you will, um, in my childhood. Wasn't sure what tomorrow was going to bring. Yeah, absolutely. And let's uh, let's discuss that. I think we. We wanted to reiterate childhood homelessness. Yes. That's what we, re, in, in looking at all of this and your mother, did you, did you ever see your mom come out? Yeah, it was probably about three years later before I would see her again when I was in fifth grade. Uh -huh. okay. But again, the, the uncertainty, you know, um, you know one, of the, one of the things my mother said before she passed away, she said, you were never in a foster home. I said, are you kidding me? What happened was oftentimes my grandmother would eventually retrieve us from the foster home and she would place us back into the custody of my mother once she got out of jail. So my mother didn't know the hell that we were going through once she was incarcerated in prison because again, she was just, she was just sent off and we were everywhere, you know? And you know, when you start talking about childhood homelessness, 
Cam, I think one of the I try to tell people there's a difference between living in poverty versus homeless. Right. And so when I was in second, yeah. So when I was in second grade, you know, we were um, living in this motel room. And I remember coming back to the motel room one day, Cam, and uh, the owner telling us, well, my, my dad tried to put the key in the door and it wouldn't work. And the owner told he was yelled at my dad saying, get off the property, get off the property. And what had happened was my, my mother and father hadn't paid the rent on the $30 a night motel room. And they simply changed the lock on the door and kept all of our stuff. I had these priceless cowboy boots that I loved. They kept them all. And we simply had to get back in the car and go right down the street to the next motel room to start life all over again. And, and, and again, my, the motel owner knew that my parents were involved in legal activity, so there, there was no call in the police. They knew that. Right. So we just simply had to take a loss and kind of keep on going. When I was in middle school and I uh, was in, in my seventh motel room, I remember the school bus cam would go pick up all my friends from the projects who were living with their single parent and living in single parent house, getting government assistance. About 100 of them. School bus, pick them up, take them to school. There was no stigma because most of the school was coming from the projects. And then me and my little brother were walking in from the motel room, several uh, a city outside of Denver. Um, no food. The school didn't have our telephone number, didn't have an address. My friends didn't know where I lived at or anything else. It was nine of us in one motel room. Um, no government assistance, again, because my parents were uh, involved in criminal activity. Um, we didn't know when we were going to show back up to the motel room and, and, and not have a place again. Uh, it was totally different than living in uh, poverty. You know, my, my right. friends who were in poverty, they knew they had an element of consistency when it came to getting government assistance, whether it be food or housing each each month. They knew that they were good. Right. Um, our minute was our, our situation was minute by minute. We never knew, you know. Right, right, right. And, and I think we need to look at that. You're coming from so foster homes, motel rooms, homeless as a senior in high school. Yes, yes. And now, you can imagine that, you know. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so in looking at that as a senior in high school, so we're moving along the way. You have been homeless most of the time, okay? Yeah. And homelessness we're speaking of is you're living with someone. You don't have right. a residence of your own. Let's right. discuss that so people can make that yes. understanding. Absolutely. So there's a there's a law called the McKinney Vento Act that's in schools. And it says that any kid who's living with uh, in a foster home, a shelter, a motel room or doubled up with another family is considered homeless. So we have a small number of cases where kids are on the streets. Uh, but the vast majority of kids who are considered homeless in schools are the kids who are living in the motel rooms, which I live in seven of them. I uh, would doubled up in a lot of family with other people. Um, and then spend a lot of time in crisis centers and also uh, foster homes as well, unfortunately. So again, as you mentioned, much of my childhood was spent bouncing around from place to place to place and dealing with homelessness uh, ongoing. And in fact, again, between my second and third grade year school, I went to four different elementary schools in one year. Can you wow. imagine that? Mm. Four different elementary schools in one year, bouncing around from place to place to place. And um, it, it was tough. Um, Again, sometimes when you're talking about my friends who grew up in poverty, they all went to the same schools. Right. They went to the same schools, elementary school, middle school, high school. Now, the situations at home weren't, weren't ideal. But again, when you're talking about homelessness, you're, you're everywhere. Your life is everywhere. Even when I, when I went off to college, Cam, as an All-American football player, I still had no stability back home in Denver. The University of Minnesota did not have a home address for me there. They actually had to create another system for me to get extra assistance for me at the University of Minnesota because I had a full ride scholarship, but my school full ride scholarship couldn't cover everything about me because I didn't have health insurance. My friends who were from Sugarland, Texas, where you guys are from, <laughs> they had, um, you know, one of them's father was a doctor, you know, and so they they had pretty nice stable situation they were coming from. But I had no health care, I had no dental care, I didn't know anything about bank accounts, I didn't know anything about anything, you know, mm -hmm. and um, so it, it was it was crazy. And then when I went back to Denver. It took me 22 hours to get from Minnesota back to Denver. Oftentimes, I didn't have anywhere to stay when I got back to Denver. So the, the bus ride would give me at least two days where I knew for sure I had somewhere to sleep at on that Greyhound bus. So even when you start talking about homelessness in college, it right. still has a, 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 an impact on those kids who are leaving those situations. So I'm so passionate about you know, making sure that we, we take care of our kids who are dealing with that, though. Yes. Right. Absolutely. A lot of people don't realize that, that they don't have anywhere to go back to. Let's talk about right. the fact of you being a senior and you had mentioned your GPA before when we were talking before this. Let's talk yes. about that. So, you know, between my junior and senior of high school, I lived in five different locations and I, my GPA 
was a 1.5, Cam. The wow. first uh, semester and then a 1.7 the next. And I remember having to, but at the time though, I missed zero days of school because I still had a vision of going to college and going to the NFL. Right. And I knew that my everything was gonna be tied to that schoolhouse. So I could not afford to stay at home. I was not late any days. I was at school every day. And, and in doing so, I barely graduated with the 2.0 that I needed to sustain my scholarship to go play football for the University of Minnesota. But you're talking about uh, being in a, I was a private school where the kids were um, on the weekends when they went skiing, they went to uh, resorts their parents partially owned, you know, so they, right. they were millionaires. And I'm coming in from riding three school buses, I mean, three city buses to get to the school each morning and then trying to do the same thing way back home. Um, it was um, it was a lot of stress. But like I told you before, I, I never took a moment to I didn't talk to anybody about it other than my best friend. I didn't talk to my teachers about it. My teachers suspected something was going on because when they sent letters home. The letters were always coming back. There was no home telephone number they had for me or anything else like that. And during this time, Cam, the movie Boys in the Hood had just come out. Mm -hmm. And I remember me and my buddy, we went to the movie theater to see Boys in the Hood. And at the end, um, the, the, the star of the movie, Ricky, gets killed. He was going to go off to college. Mm -hmm. And I remember my friend looking at me saying, man, that's your story, T, because mo both my brothers were involved in gangs at the time. Right. And at that time, I'd already been in, I'd almost been killed in a drive-by shooting. So the University of Minnesota, they even got me out of there early out of Denver because they didn't want me, once they found out my situation, they didn't want me, you know, being subjected to some of the violence that I was dealing with back in Five Points in Denver, Colorado. So again, the, the, the aspects of it was, my life was just so unstable. I had no control of my life. What's, what's, you know, in any aspect of it. So it was, every day was a constant battle, constant fight, you know, constant, you know, am I gonna survive today? So I look back today, I mean, I'm so grateful I mean, I was literally living homeless, living out of this trunk behind me as a senior in high school. You can still see the you can still see the Greyhound sticker behind me. Right. My family put me on a Greyhound bus 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Put me on a Greyhound bus. And that that trunk has never been back to Denver. Wow. Never been back to Denver. That carried everything I owned from Denver. I never moved back home. You never moved. So back everywhere home. I go, that trunk is with me. Yes. Never wow. moved back home. Wow. And looking what you always say is this. I want people to know that our stories, good or bad, made make us who we are and what we decide to become. Yes, yes. You know what, Cam, we, we have a choice. I didn't know at the time, but we have a choice in terms of what we choose to do with our situations, you know? So all the adversity that I was dealing with was giving me some advantages as well. Wow. Because one thing I always had was I was always a, a strong and hard worker. Mm -hmm. So I was a person who was never gonna give up. So right. when I went off to college and, uh, you know, a lot of my teammates in particular, some of them who were from Sugar Land, couldn't face the academics or the challenges of being away from home. They quit and went back home. I never quit. I kept going. I was hungry because I knew that there was nothing waiting for me and that school was going to be my only option. So sometimes, you know, our hardships can be the very thing that gives us a heart for something great. You know, right. um, our goodbyes can open up the door for something really good. Um, uh, the pain leads to purpose. So that's one of the things I've really discovered from my journey in life. And I try to share that with other people that sometimes the pain that you may be going through post COVID may be the thing that's going to give you purpose later on, because there are a lot right. of people who are out there struggling uh, right now. And maybe this is the time for you to start doing some, some reflection and start saying, okay, well, what is, what are the lessons that I'm learning from this rejection? You know, what are, what are the um, what am I getting from the setback? Because every every setback gives us feedback, you know. Mm -hmm. So as I was going through the situations, I was saying to myself, "What am I learning from this? What am I learning from this?" And Cam, the number one thing for me for me that kept coming up was, I got to maximize my education. I got to maximize the education. So I went on and got four college degrees, um, including my doctorate, because I said I had no safety nets for me back home in Denver. So I mm -hmm. kept fighting. I kept fighting because I said every degree that I get is going to equal an opportunity me to do something with my life and it gives me a chance to be a role model for those kids out there who are wondering can i do it and i'm here to tell them yes you can do it absolutely, absolutely. let's do this yeah. we'll take a break and we'll be right back on the cam hill show we'll be right back to the cam hill show after these messages move up at ron carter cadillac drive the new 2021 cadillac xt4 luxury collection for only 319 a month the new 2021 cadillac xt5 luxury collection for only 399 a month both for 39 months lease with just one dollar down or purchase either and enjoy 0.9 percent apr for 72 months plus bonus cash golf freeway just two minutes south of the beltway shop smarter when you shop ron carter ron carter cadillac 
hyperneedle promise is to make sure my baby is safe and healthy. Because I know it is possible to acquire syphilis, HIV, or other STDs without knowing it, getting tested is my very first chance to protect my baby. Doctors are required to give expectant mothers three separate tests for syphilis. If you're pregnant, ask your doctor if you're being tested properly for syphilis and other STDs. Congenital syphilis can lead to a miscarriage, stillbirth, or an infant death. Don't risk your baby's health. To find out more, visit MyPrenatalPromise.com. Amazing things for you. And now back to the Cam Hill Show. Hey, family, we're back with Dr. Tommy Watson. Uh, we were just talking, man, your story. I was just reading some of the uh, texts from people and also responses. They are just so intrigued by this story and knowing the four degrees. And let's talk about the degrees. And first, how going from a senior going to the university that you went to, in between, how did you choose that school? You know, because many are coming after you. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, I, um, I actually chose um, TCU in, um, in Fort Worth, Texas. That's where I was headed to at first. Uh -huh. So as I was going through the recruiting process, Cam, my mother had gotten out of prison my junior year, and she couldn't find work because she had been in prison so many times, but she, her heart was in the right place. So she ended up turning into selling drugs to take care of us. In the middle of my senior year of high school, she ended up going back to prison in the middle of my senior year of high school. And that's when the homeless situation turned over for me. And in the meantime, I've been recruited by all these college coaches, that, you know, who are coming to, who are trying to come to my home. And at the time, I remember I would have my aunt and my mom's friend posing as my mother um, because I had a few more days left at the apartment that we we're in. So the coaches wouldn't think there's anything was going on. I was literally taking the trips to the college's on my own you know a lot of my teammates were going visiting with their families i remember even going to university of minnesota cam i didn't even have the coat to go up there. i had to borrow somebody's jacket from denver to go to minnesota with to deal with the cold weather up there for my recruiting trip but again there was no parents that they were able to talk to there was no one there um and i simply made the decision by where i had the most fun at and i enjoyed tcu but uh the coach left TCU after um, uh, after a month after I committed there and went to University of Minnesota, and I followed him there because that's the uh, Jim Wacker was a guy I knew. Ended up being a great decision for me, um, but again, it was it was so stressful because I'm again I'm going to places where I'm looking around at all these other football players coming out of the schools, and these folks are you know relatively stable. Yes, and um, you know matter matter they of fact, money. I have let. Yeah, absolutely. I have letters, Cam, where I show audience when I go speak all the different places that the co the coaches were sending letters trying to find me. It's like five different places they were sending letters, you know, trying to find me my, during my senior year of high school because they, they they just could not find me. So, again, me sitting here today is, I mean, nothing but a blessing, and I can't thank God every day for the opportunity uh, once I got the chance to go off to University of Minnesota. And, again, I left there, Cam. It was supposed to be one of my highlights I remember getting on the Greyhound bus, Cam, and um, heading out, leaving from Denver. And again, I grew up in Colorado's first black neighborhood, Five Points. And I remember as the bus left the terminal and I was heading towards Minnesota, something in my gut, Cam, just told me this would never be your home ever again. Wow. And I remember just start, I just started crying and crying on that bus for 22 hours. I got to Minnesota. My head was pounding. And the lady next to me was like, are you okay, son? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine, you know. So one thing I started doing was I, I learned how to play it off by just smiling. Yes. Even though inside I was, I was dying inside, you know. But um, I got to Minnesota. There was no home address that I'd give anyone. The stress was, I mean, the stress was enormous. And, you know, even my second year of college, I had some small bouts of even contemplating suicide because the pain was so great. I, I remember trying to. I, and again, I didn't know what was going on at the time, Cam. I, I would cry myself to sleep. I'm saying, How, I'm this big, strong football player. Why am I crying myself to sleep at night? Right. You know, and but you know, because we may leave somewhere physically, leave the pain physically. Right. We never leave the pain. It's still with us, Cam. You know. Right. And that's why I, I really challenge people to say, you know, whatever your story is, take the lessons you learned from it, embrace it, 
-hmm. and uh, utilize it to help other people and heal yourself. Because again, wherever you run to, there you are. Right. You can run as far as you want to, but that story, that pain, those experiences are going to always be with you until you deal with them. What I love about this story and what I love about you, uh, Dr. Tommy Watson, we've talked, be you know, briefly before, but I did read your story extensively. I did look at it. And I want people to understand you went knowing you had a 2.0 average. You already yeah. knew that. OK. Yeah. And this is going up against 4.5, 4.0s, 4. Yes. 4. Point, you know, these are everybody is coming from all over. Yes. What made yes. you stay and get four degrees? Yeah, you know, Cam, for you know, many years, man, I thought something was going on with me in school because you know I had a learning disability. We came right. to reading, so I couldn't read mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Um, I remember my, my classmates would make fun of me and what have you, though. Yeah. But one of the things it pushed me to do, Cam, it, it forced me to become a good reader in terms of comprehension. Right. So I was always a hard worker in the classroom, no matter what Fs I got uh, or Ds I got. I was always willing to keep working hard. And, and, and for me, Cam, quitting was never an option, though. Right. I had those few moments where I thought about suicide. But for the most part, quitting for me was never going to be an option. When I was in that motel room in eighth grade, Cam, there was never a day in that motel room where I said this is going to be my future. Ever, right. ever, ever. I never. I was always saying, I don't know what my future is going to be, but this right here is not going to be my future right here. As a matter of fact, when I was living in that motel room, Cam, with all nine people, yes. when I got a chance, when, when the coach came in from the inner cities, from the suburbs and talk to me my comrades from inner cities about going to this private suburban Denver school. While living in that motel room, I went on and won the Colorado Youth Citizenship Award, which is only given to a handful of kids in the state of Colorado. I got an honor roll. I became the one-on-one -on -one basketball champion of my school, uh, the wrestling champion of my school. So there's something that's that's amazing that happens when a, when a person has hope. And right. it wasn't because I was really smart. It wasn't because I was special. It was because I had hope. I had hoped that that high school was going to open up some doors for me, Cam. It was going to do something for me. So I got to college and I was struggling. Even in my high school years when I was struggling, I kept saying to myself, get the education. It's going to give you an opportunity. Mm -hmm. get the education is going to give you an opportunity. It's going to be your pathway to the NFL because I want to go to the NFL. And I want, to, I want all the folks to know out there that there is never – and this is what my teachers told me. This is how they got me to buy an education. My goal was always to go to the NFL. Cam, no one in my neighborhood that had education or anything else like that. So the, the teachers in my school simply told me, they said, Tommy, if you want to go to the NFL, you got to go to college first. Right. There has never, ever been an NFL player who's won the NFL who hasn't gone to college for at least three years. Mm -hmm. So school, college was on my radar screen the entire time. And by the time I finally got hurt in my fourth year of college, I said, wow, it may behoove me to stick right here and get my degree. Right. Once I got that degree, I said, you know what? I, I don't have any safety nets. I better go back and get a second degree and a mm -hmm. third degree. In a fourth degree, and my, my my doctorate was really personal for me. You know, I said I want to achieve this, so I can be called Dr. Tommy Watson. Not from a standpoint of I'm better than someone else, though, but as in terms of a personal achievement, right. in terms of a person going from a motel room. You know, one of the greatest honors I had, Cam. I was speaking to some gang members in in um, Omaha, Nebraska, and the gang member said, "Hey, man, you sound like the homies, but you doctor. I can get with that." I said, you you darn right you can. You can do everything I'm doing up here as well. Right. Just because you're in a game don't mean you can't do it, though. So that's one of the greatest honors that I have in terms of getting that doctorate degree, in terms of what doors it opens up and what type of hope it opens up for other kids and other individuals who may be in tough situations. Even if you're in a situation where you come out of COVID-19, where you've lost jobs, you've lost loved ones, you lost uh, income, if you can keep hope alive, well, you can thrive. Absolutely. Let's talk Without about it, you being a be movie producer. You're a movie producer yes. also. Why so? Yes, sir. You know, so, you know, another thing I did, you know, I, I wrote my book here, A Face of Courage, which is behind me here. And I always had a dream, Cam, of turning into a story because I know there are some people who like to read, but there's other people who don't like reading. So one of my challenges was I wanted to, to convert my um, my story into a movie. And I did that with a short film called Resilient. And we won seven awards uh, globally. Now I'm in the process of pitching my TV series to executives in Hollywood and in Atlanta in hopes that it'll be able to be turned into a TV series. Again, just another avenue to inspire people to be great and to also shed light on childhood homelessness. I'm very, very passionate about that because we have a, we have about 2 million kids in our country right now who are dealing with childhood homelessness every day. Absolutely. Every day they're going back. And imagine this. Not, I want to throw this out to your, your listeners and your viewers. Imagine if you're living in a shelter, okay, 
you get suspended from school because of behavior stuff. And most behavioral stuff is driven by family stuff. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Kid comes in grumpy because he's witnessed this right here. When you go to a shelter, they require you to leave the shelter during the daytime. So if you're now suspended from school, where do you go, Cam? Right. Mm-hmm. Where do you go? Yeah, if absolutely. you're sick, where do you go? Yeah. You don't get days off when you're living in homeless. Yeah. You got to bet every day is a battle. Mm-hmm. So I even tell educators, you got to be very, very sensitive to the needs of your students. Because again, uh, kicking, yes, you want, you want kids to come to school and listen and behave correctly. But sometimes suspending them can do more damage than helping them in some right. situations. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's, look at the, let's look at the trailer for Resilient. Well, now, how do you reckon we're going to pay these thousands of dollars for his schooling? Uh, the school offers a scholarship that covers half his tuition. Boy, you ain't getting no scholarship to college. And you ain't going to school with all them white folks out there. Down in a city's hollow. This is a very serious offense. An offense using a gun. You're not even old enough to own a gun. We What's wrong? You know that part? Yeah. Go on. Tommy! Tommy! Each other slowly biting. I don't get it at all. They're gonna go down the wrong road looking at you living your life like a <laughs> We better run, hide and hide. Our body starts it until the end. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Resilient. That's, that's yes. Thanks for sharing that with the audience as well. You know, as you as you share those pieces, I think back to uh when my little brother got in heavily involved in gangs, Cam, I almost made a decision that almost changed my life. You know, taking up for my little brother, I got involved in a situation where I got roped into a situation where I had a gun and I'm getting ready to pull it on these guys. Thank God I didn't have bullets. Thank God I was smart enough to at least take the bullets out of it, though. Or it could have been a completely different situation because my little brother ended up taking the same gun back to school and attempted to shoot a kid and ended up having to serve uh, some time in, in juvenile prison behind it. But, you know, again, I, I thank God um, over and over again because of some of the dumb things that I could have done. Mm-hmm. He kept me from them and gave me a second chance, you know. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. And doing that, and, and there are a lot of things that are in the movie that you want you you're talking about. But childhood homelessness was one of the major things that both of us discussed. What we yeah. really people really don't understand that uh, what it means uh, as far and also foster care. Absolutely. Let's talk about yeah. foster care. You had been in foster, several foster cares, right? Absolutely. You know, my, my first run in foster care, again, I mentioned when I was in second grade, my parents would leave us for days by ourselves. And I remember, right. Cam, um, just, you know, we're at home, not sure my parents are going to come back. And suddenly, you know, there's a knock at the door and it's the sheriffs and they're and the social worker and they're hauling us off. And we're like, where are we going? You know? And uh, shortly after that, we find ourselves in this foster home. Now, keep in mind, it's been my sixth grade sister, my fifth grade sister. My, me, I'm second grade. My little brother was in first grade, and we had a one-year-old baby sister. We were basically raising her, Kim. We taught her how to walk. We fed her. We changed her. We did everything. I was nine right. years old, dropped my little sister on the floor. We get to this foster home, Kim. My little sister is placed into a different foster home. It killed me. That was one of the probably the most difficult things I had to, ever had to deal with. Can you imagine being separated from like that from one of your one of your, your siblings or someone you love so dearly, and you don't have any control over it? Mm-hmm. So the anger I had in foster home was unbelievable towards the foster parent. And it wasn't because she was a bad person or anything, though. It was because I went through so much in that time. And then I got a chance to meet my older brother by pure coincidence in a foster home who was adopted by another lady who just happened to be a friend of the of the foster parent who I was with. It, it, it was mind blowing, though, you know. And can you imagine going to a school? You were in second grade in a foster home and you show up there with the person who's your your guardian and people aren't are asking is that your mom and the foster parent doesn't know what to say i don't know what to say you know don't know how to respond to it it's an awkward situation awkward dance you know yes. and then you know uh having to deal with with situations where they do family events it's their family we're the foster kids it's really not our family so we're at a family event, but we're not really the family. You know, we're kind of like the, the 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 stepchild who's 
kind of just showing up at the party, you know? So right. uh, being in foster care can be a very, very difficult thing for a lot of young people. There are some foster parents who do an excellent job of making sure the kids feel a part of the family, feel welcome. But in many situations, it's very difficult because you're bringing in kids who've been through a lot of trauma before they reach your doorstep. And you got to realize that, uh, you know, the personal tax you may be getting, the, the fines you may be getting, it's not because of you, but it's because of years of pain, you know, right. that people, that kids go through. Yeah. Right, right. The other thing, too, is that I want people to know with foster care, with you having siblings, that means that foster care parent, if they're keeping you together and it's yeah. six of you, that means yeah. six children have to come into that home. Under, right. You Absolutely. know what I'm saying? Even though Absolutely. I know they get assistance and things like that. You still have six different personalities coming in. Absolutely. We want to Absolutely. know that that is a real big thing for, I'll say it, African-Americans. We've got to you know, help if we can. Absolutely. And, and, you know, thank God that my grandmother was one of my aunt as well. My aunt Mildred, my grandmother, Helen, they were people who came and rescued us from the foster home. Right. Because I think sometimes, you know, um, I was amazed. I was talking to a young lady in, in Mississippi, and she was talking about the high number of black kids in Mississippi in foster home. I said, wow, right. it's a lot of that's the case too. because yeah. there are so many black kids where the families are still intact and near each other. I said, wow, how, how does that happen, though? You know, so, you know, I, I really hope that we can have more of our family members step up to the plate and, and really help right. out in some of those situations with those kids who are being placed. Because, again, what happens is in many situations, Foster parents are not going to take in six kids. They don't have the capacity to take in six right. kids. They're going to take in two. They're going to take in three. They're going to take in four. Um, we it was four of us. That was the max that they got for us. You know, um, other situations when you're a teenager, it's much more difficult for you to find a foster home because now you're coming with a lot more baggage that a lot of people don't necessarily want. So the 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 dynamics of dealing with the foster care system, even in adoption becomes very, very tricky for a lot of kids who are in those situations if we don't have family members who are willing to step up to the plate like my Aunt Mildred did. She sacrificed so much of her life to bring me and my three siblings in and with her three kids as well. So right. um, it's a sacrifice, but it's it's um, something that's needed in, in some situations for sure. Wow, that is something. And I'm glad you're putting a light on it too. The other thing too is that in foster care, once you, this is the other thing, once you become 18, you're you're yeah. out. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And imagine now being out of a situation where you've grown up and you've probably been in multiple foster homes. So you right. don't really have a stable home. OK, you don't have a stable connection with some of the adults. And now you're cut off from government assistance and you're just thrown out to the world and just say, go survive. Right. One, if I, if I became president today, the first law that I would change is I would give each of those kids who are in foster care or dealing with homelessness at least a four year four years of eligibility to get an education on some institution uh -huh. to give them some stability up until they're 23 years old because right. they need that time to get stable. I mean, it took me every bit of five years at the university of Minnesota to get some stability under, to learn about bank accounts. Again, think about that camp. I didn't learn how to, I didn't know how to learn, open a bank account. I didn't know what a bank account was mm -hmm. because my parents put the money underneath the mattress. Right. My mom carried the money in her bra. Right. Cam, when we iron clothes, we iron clothes on the floor and in the bed. There was no ironing boards. Right. So there was so much I had to learn. I didn't know how to cook or anything. So there's so many just basic skills that you you think that kids have, my kids have today, that a lot of those kids in those situations don't necessarily have. And I'm not saying all of them in foster care have no situations, but many of them do. And then we're simply cutting them off at the age of 18. Age 18 is not the time to cut a young person off who's been through that type of challenge and trauma and try to throw them out to the world and say, hey, go survive now. It's, it's not fair on those young people. I think we need to also bring up, and you, you've, you've brought a lot, that's why I said, to the table, and I thank you for this, because it has not been spoken about extensively yeah. at all yeah. that's needed. That the mm -hmm. fact that even during this time, one main thing about going to school is thinking, and if you can't yes. eat and you're yes. hungry, you're, yes. you, know, you, don't, you, you haven't bathed, you know, you're out yes. there, so how yeah. can you concentrate? Yeah. You know, Cam, when I was in that motel room in eighth grade, I would probably go weeks without taking a bath. Right. Weeks. Right. And, and, and keep in mind, we would walk around in our, in, on, the, on the motel room floor in our socks. So the motel room rug was filthy. 
So my socks were filthy. Right. We often talked about it at school, you know, made a fun of because we were musty and our clothes weren't clean or anything else, though. And, and it was tough. I even had teachers talking about me, laughing at me in gym class, you know, making jokes about the way I smelt and right. everything else. And it was painful. You know, it was really painful. But my outlet, Cam, was sports. Thank God for sports. Yeah. Sports became my saving grace because I knew, Cam, if I could excel in an area of sports, on, on the basketball court, it wasn't about what I had or didn't have off the court. It was right. about my skill set on the court. Absolutely. So I mastered the game of basketball and became a really good basketball player and a really good football people player so that my game on the court or, or the field was at the same place, same par as everyone else. It wasn't about what I was lacking or, or, or did have off the court, off the field. But um, that's a huge challenge, though, when you're going places and you, know, you don't have clothing. I, I remember, Cam, my senior year of, of high school, I was, in, um, I was one of the all-city top basketball players in the state. And, and my shoes, I had a big hole in my shoe. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't even find nobody to, to you know, who was willing to even buy me a pair of shoes. You know, and, and again, I was I was asking, like you said before, we talked about this before, sometimes people get hospitality fatigue when they're taking care of you so much. I got to a place where I was tired of asking for help, you know, and I, and I just didn't want to keep asking for help. So I just, I endured. I had my toe hung out my shoe and I scored 25 points and I just kind of, kept going but it was it was embarrassing it was painful all those things that come into play with it yeah absolutely let's do this we'll take a break and we'll be right back on the cam hill show we'll be right back to the cam hill show after these messages I'm a part of the prenatal care club now, taking all my STD tests. Did you know your doctors required bylaw to test you three times for syphilis and HIV? Yes, my husband and I are making sure I get all three tests. Oh, good. Testing is the key to preventing congenital syphilis. And good prenatal care is your first labor of love. Glad to hear your husband is so involved. Thank you. Yes, taking all my STD tests for syphilis is important to both of us. My prenatal promise is to prevent a stillbirth or miscarriage. To find out more, visit myprenatalpromise.com. Amazing things for you. Move up at Ron Carter Cadillac with the new 2021 XT6 Luxury Collection with standard third row seating for just $4.59 a month for 39 months lease with just $1 down. Or purchase and receive 0.9% APR for 72 months plus $17.50 bonus cash at Gulf Freeway, just two minutes south of the Beltway. Test drive the new 2021 Escalade today at Ron Carter Cadillac. Shop smarter when you shop Ron Carter. Ron Carter Cadillac. And now back to the Cam Hill Show. Hey, family, we are back with Dr. Tommy Watson. People didn't know this, but I want to just bring up, you were a school principal, and I just want to ask this one question about that. As a principal, a teacher, people that are in the world, what should we be looking out for and what can we do when we yeah, that's see a great question. the child is, you know, the children that are homeless have homeless. Actually, children. I think one of the first things you have to do, I, I even challenge my, my staff to do is build quality relationships with your students. Mm -hmm. Don't make assumptions. Don't make assumptions about how they dress. Don't make assumptions about how they speak, how, how they don't speak with the color of their skin or anything else, though. Build relationships with all kids. Get to know them. Find out about them. And then once you find out about them, don't judge their situation. Find out what their hook is. Again, the folks in my high school, Cam, they found out that my hook was sports. Mm -hmm. So no one told me that, hey, you know what? You might not go to the NFL. You better have a plan B, your chance to slim. They said, hey, great time. You want to go to the NFL? Great. You got to go to college first. So I bought in academically to everything they were talking about because they didn't kill my dream. We right. can't kill the dreams of our kids. Whatever it is our kids want to do, let them dream. Let them dream. Expose them to opportunities. So, you know, if you have a kid who wants to play sports, Great. Start with the sports aspects, starts and then expose them to what it takes to be a commentator. Take, expose them what it takes to be, um, um, you know, there's all these uh, the owner of the team. There's all these different um, fields that they can you can introduce them to that surrounds the game of sports. So whatever it is a kid wants to do, don't kill their dream because that's their hook. 
The hook is the one thing that you get buy-in from your kids on, and it gives you a chance to keep them engaged. And you want our kids to have goals, and we want them to have hope more than anything. Because, again, when our kids have hope, we know that they, they can succeed and do anything despite the challenges that they're coming from. When they can believe that there's a brighter future out there for them, Cam, yeah. they can do it. They can do they it. They can do it. In particular, our kids, they can do it. We they have a lot of brilliant kids out there. Yeah, we really do. they can do it. We really yeah. do. And by you being a school principal, how do we have – uh, make children buy in or have them or convince them to buy in to school, to academics, yeah. to going, you yeah. know, from being a senior on through college. What do we need to do? Yes. Well, uh, again, I think everything starts, Cam, with that hook. You got to find out what the kids' interests, goals, dreams are mm -hmm. and begin to tie the academics into what those things are. For example, if you have a kid who wants to be a, a, a doctor or a lawyer, start talking about some of the classes they need to take in, in, in um, college. And then high school and then middle school and elementary school and talk about some of the skill sets they don't need. You know, you got to be able to be a communicator. You got to be able to read. You got to be able to write. So kids, it begin to make more sense to kids at that point in time. Also, Kim, this is this is a very important piece there. You got to introduce them to other people who are doing what it is that they, that they want to be doing. Right. You know, I, I, one of my classmates, I played football with the University of Minnesota was from uh, he went to Willow Ridge High School there in Sugarland, Texas. And he talked about one of the things his teachers used to do. She used to bring in someone from the community every Friday and introduce the students to different careers. We gotta go back to doing some of those things. We gotta, we gotta take a break from the academics sometimes and introduce and make sure our kids are getting what they need emotionally, behaviorally, and socially. Because when we cover those areas, Cam, our kids will buy into the academics. Again, if I'm coming to your school, Cam, and I'm not eating, you can tell me about three times three is nine all you want. I'm not listening. Right. I'm hungry. Right. I'm hungry. Right. Yeah, I'm hungry. Yeah. Or if I've been up all night because my dad has been beat up on my mom, yes, I'm. I got some other stuff. I need to talk to one of your school counselors. I need some other stuff going. Or, or if, if the drive-by shooting that took place in my house is it took place the night before, I got to talk to someone about that. If my right. door's been kicked in because of a drug dealer, drug deal going bad, you got to give kids. We got to meet our kids emotionally, socially, and behaviorally where they are before we start going to the academics, and then they'll buy into those things, Cam. When right. they know that it's that saying that says, you know. That no one cares how much you care and today no what does it say? No one really cares how much you I can't remember. I, whatever the quote is, you need to care first. Yes. <laughs> care, you gotta show care first. I, 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 I messed that one up though. But you gotta care first before kids know you buy into okay. them, right? No so, worries. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you're right about that. You absolutely right. Uh about uh the kids in themselves, you know, because they're going to school hungry, can't yeah. concentrate. They've gone through stuff right before, you know, many mm -hmm. have. Yeah. And, you know, Kim, even when I was at the private suburban Denver High School, the rich kids, they went through stuff. I mean, yeah. th their parents gave them a credit card and told them to make it work while they went to Europe for two months. Right. You know, so you now you have a young person who's trying to figure out, you know, how, how to live life. Yeah, yeah, you've got millions, but you don't have the connection between your parents as well. So all of our kids need to know and make that connection emotionally, socially and behaviorally and then get them to buy into academics, you know, and not, again, we can't make assumptions about kids based upon the backgrounds, uh, whether it be from affluent areas or homeless areas, build the connections with the kids, whether it be black, white, male, female, build the connections with them, find out what it is they want to do, expose them to opportunities. You know, I had a guy on my podcast the other day grew up in the inner cities of uh, West Chicago, and he said one of the things he did, Cam, to keep himself sane, he would leave the neighborhood. Yeah. Walk downtown, downtown Chicago to get himself, um, exposed to something different so we right. got to expose our kids to other things you got to expose them to other things that's one of the, that's one reason i moved to charlotte north carolina i wanted my kids to see more african americans who were doing well and not just the, the couple of us who were doing well in minnesota so that exposure is absolutely critical in everything we're doing absolutely i love that what have you learned along the way wow you know what i think i've, I've learned that every obstacle um opens up a door for opportunity mm -hmm. I, I learned that Cam, that even in our darkest days, if you're still here listening to the sound of my voice, I want to give you this right here. You have survived 100% of your most challenging times. Mm -hmm. If you are here today listening to my voice, you have survived 100% of your most challenging times. So what you have to do now is start saying, okay, what are the lessons I've learned from it? How do I take those lessons and turn it into what God has put me on this earth to do in terms of my purpose? What is my purpose? around my lessons and my connections mm -hmm. and my story. So everything that you've gone through in life, there's some purpose with it. Even though it, it can be as painful as, you know, as anyone has endured, there's still some purpose 
they're behind it. So again, find out your purpose, find out the lessons that need to be learned from it and find out who needs to hear your message because there's someone out there right now who needs to hear your message. You know what I'm saying? Right. So you got to, there's an audience out there for you. Share that message. Yes. Absolutely. It is an audience. What would you like to leave with the viewers? Well, you know, I want to leave that, that message of hope because you've heard my story of challenging times and everything else. The acronym that I like using for hope is have only positive expectations. So no matter what situation you're facing right now, you have to believe in the end you're going to win. You have to see yourself there before you ever even get there. You have to be it and then do it and then you have it. So whatever it is you're striving for in life, be it mentally first, do the work, and then you'll have it later. But don't give up hope no matter what you do, though. But that hope is one of the most powerful tools in our in our society. So keep it, keep hope alive and thrive. Absolutely. I love that. How do people get your books? Because you have a face of courage. The re- and the other one is the resilience of champions and then the movie. Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. So if you're interested in any of my books, you can go to TAWatson.com, TAWatson.com. Or you can find the books on Amazon or anywhere else that sells books. Uh, face of Courage is the one about my personal story. Resilience of Champions are, is based upon the um, the lessons that I've learned uh, growing up through that story. And again, the um, the movie is called Resilient Below Poverty, which is the TV series that I'm pitching towards Hollywood now. The, you know, the name may change once we get further down the line or what have you, though. But the premise of childhood homelessness will still be the uh, uh, the focal point of the uh, the TV series as well. So, again, we'd love for you guys to follow me on social media. I'm out there, easy to find. Again, tawatson.com. Uh, share with me your messages or if you got questions, uh, reach out to me, though. So I look forward to connecting with you. And again, Cam, I can't thank you enough for having me on my sh- on your show and allowing me to expose the uh, audience to my thoughts and uh, my story as well. Absolutely. You have a podcast. When is it? Yeah, so my podcast airs every uh, Monday and Wednesday <laughs> called uh, Resilient Stories. We just had Snoop Dogg's mom on there right. uh, the day before yesterday. She talked about, you know, the challenges that come along with, you know, raising a superstar like like uh like him you know recently i did one with uh dc glenn mm-hmm. uh cecil cecil glenn yeah. from tag team they have the number one commercial in america from geico and um you know he tells an interesting story he just happens to be from my hometown of denver as well so tune in go to resilient stories podcast you can hear some amazing stories of individuals men who've overcome obstacles we've all yeah. had obstacles in our lives cam and there's a lot that people can learn from our from our stories. Absolutely. Absolutely. He has a great podcast. I follow it. It's excellent. 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 I appreciate you so much, my friend. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep motivating people. Keep telling your story because you, my friend, are a true testimony of what great is. Thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate you. Thank you very much, brother. Talk Absolutely. Appreciate you having me 1231, 30 Central Standard Time, the Cam Hill Show. See you then. Bye.